So this week we're going to talk about William Glasser choice theory. Um, William Glasser, uh, they they put out a, a series of videos um, after the Gloria tapes, um, and they were called the Linda tapes. Um, they were not available, but if you ever get a chance to watch the Linda tapes, uh, Glasser has an interesting role play. Um, there are a number of role plays on both Films On Demand through our library and also through our library uh, academic videos, it's called. Um, and you go down to the search by alphabet and you click on A and just go down until you find academic video and do a search for William Glasser. And there is a uh, collection of role plays um, that William Glasser has done. Uh, I posted a documentary, but um, if you're interested in watching a counseling role play, uh, you can watch one of these. And uh, But I think one of the differences with the Linda tapes is it's an actual counseling session. And uh, I think that's always more interesting than a role play. It's real life. So let's look at the, the theory or the history of William Glasser first. Um, 1925 to 2013, uh, I met, uh, I met Bill Glasser many times. Um, he was at many of the conferences for ACA, uh, and other conferences. He was always with Wobelding, um, and, uh, and he was usually a pretty friendly guy to talk with. Both of them, both of them were. Um, the, uh, so his history educated at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, uh, originally a chemical engineer, but turned to psychology and then psychiatry. Um, so he was a pretty concrete thinker being, you know, starting out in engineering, um, I don't know what how, what made him make that change um, from chemical engineering to psychology. I never heard the story with that. If you know it, post it in the discussion board. Um, and uh, but he also became, of course, a medical doctor in psychiatry. He often criticizes psychiatry, though. And if he was not a psychiatrist, everybody would ignore him. Say, well, he's not a psychiatrist. What's he know? But he is a psychiatrist, so they have to take him seriously. I agree with some things he says and disagree with others. We'll talk about that. Um, he was trained at the uh, VA, Veterans Administration, and UCLA in Los Angeles. Um, he rejected Freud's theory very early and, uh, and originated reality therapy by 1962. Um, most people still call his theory reality therapy. Um, and uh, I guess that's the most famous book on it. But he does have a new book, uh, or a recent book, called Choice Theory. Um, He's another theorist, you know, that takes some things from other theories and also adds his own ideas. Uh, and we'll point those out as we discuss this. The whole theory is based on the premise of we are responsible for what we choose to do. Of course, we talked about that in existential uh, theory. Um, of course, Sartre and uh, other people uh, talked about that. 
Uh, we are products of our past, but not victims in the present. And of course, uh, Adler also talked about that. Uh, all problems are dealt with in the present and relationship is stress. Um, so most of the modern theories uh, with Gestalt and um, person-centered uh, and existentialism really begin to focus on the now. Theory's not very effective with extremely young children, but it's good for parents. Now, you know, I think cognitively the child has to be old enough to understand choice and responsibility, uh, making a choice to change, things like that, uh, that they have control over choices and emotions. Um, and that might be different ages for different children. But I've used this with school-aged children in elementary school. Um, Glasser promoted education. He worked in schools uh, extensively. He has a book on uh, schools. Um, he believed that success in school could help individuals to overcome other issues. Consulted for several years with the Ventura School for Girls, California Youth Authority. I find that this theory works extremely well for middle school and high school uh, young adults um, with behavior problems, conduct problems, whatever you want to call it. Uh, oppositional defiance. Um, so let's look at the theory itself. And uh, Glasser first looked at control theory by William Powers. And uh, he says he enhanced that and renamed it. Well, William Powers, I'm sure he appreciated that. Hey, thanks for taking my theory, enhancing it, and renaming it. I've never heard what William Powers' reaction to that. I don't even know if he was still alive when uh, Glasser did that. But, you know, at least he gave him credit, uh, and he called it choice theory. So, 1998, he published Choice Theory, uh, New Psychology of Personal Freedom. Two early books, which he's more famous for our reality therapy uh, that's really what got his theory going and the one on schools is called schools without failure when we talk about reality therapy or choice theory it's based on a combination of uh, his earlier reality therapy and powers control theory um, both uh, modified over time and uh, I just like calling it by its modern name choice theory um, so something to remember here is that Glasser believed underlying problems of any emotional disorder are uh, either the client does not have a relationship or the client is involved in an unsatisfying relationship. So most of his counseling sessions are about relationships and choices. Reality therapy uh, teaches the client to behave in more effective ways, I would say to make more effective choices, which will then facilitate more positive relationships, the therapeutic goal being to gain a satisfying relationship. Uh, Glasser does not believe in the DSM diagnoses, even though he's a psychiatrist. And this is really a big point of contention because he's pretty extreme on this. Um, he had a new book out on psychiatry and medication titled Warning, Psychiatry Can Be Hazardous to Your Mental Health. Uh, 
think that was the book people argued about the most. This is the biggest problem people have with his theory. So he went all the way on this, you know. He, he didn't want to get into any diagnoses. I, I would say that um, there is a difference between uh, physical uh, issues and emotional issues. Um, physical issues can cause emotional issues, but so, for instance, there's a difference between a chemical imbalance and an emotional reaction to a situation. There's a difference between um, the size of one's ventricles in the brain and uh, possibly a result of schizophrenia and uh, people experiencing um, maybe some anxiety uh, that is a reaction to a stressor. Um, so I think, yes, there, there are differences, and some diagnoses are necessary. In fact, uh, if there's a physical cause, they should probably be included in the ICD-10, which is the medical diagnostic manual. Anyway, um, so I'm somewhere in between on this, as most people, I'm guessing, are. Um, I do not like labels. I don't like a lot of the cons that come with a diagnosis, and that's why I'm somewhere in between. I think we have overdiagnosis. Um, I think labels follow people sometimes when maybe they shouldn't, but... Uh, for uh, many cases, diagnoses can also help, uh, like finding the appropriate medication and treatment. Anyway, that's another class. The problem, he says, is not so much mental illness, but the choices we make. Um, he uses phrases so that clients take ownership of their choices. Now, um, I know that often, um, you know, a major depression is the result of a, you know, chemical imbalance of not enough serotonin, and uh, it may not be a choice for the individual. But Glasser would say, uh, rather than a client coming in and saying, I am depressed, he would say, please use the phrase, I am choosing to depress. So he moves it from a passive, a condition that is happening to a client, to an active choice that the client is making. And I know many individuals who disagree with this, and that's fine. I'm somewhere in between, depending on the case. Using the verbal active tense rather than the passive tense um, for whatever, whatever the issue was. His view of human nature, he believes that humans are not blank slates. We're born with five basic needs, all humans. I kind of think he grabbed a lot of this from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. First one, survival. Uh, and that includes shelter, food, clothing, all of that good stuff. Second one, love and belonging. The third one, power, feeling empowered, uh, having some personal power. Uh, fourth one, freedom. And the fifth one, fun. Um, so that's his own set of five needs that he believes uh, people strive to meet, and we make choices in order to meet those needs. Of course, love and belonging is extremely important because that's usually where relationships come in. When we ask ourselves, what is a successful life, we first need at least one successful relationship. That's what he believes. 
Therapy is the skilled teaching of choice theory. We identify frustrated needs in the client, needs that are not being met, uh, or at least not satisfactorily. Um, we change uh, one's choices and behaviors. We satisfy the needs and we are rewarded with positive feelings. So that's the process that a client moves through. One of the things that is a little confusing is the quality world. Uh, he believes that we each have experienced positive feelings in our lives and we connect things with those memories of positive feelings. It might be a memory of a thing, an action, an experience, but things are people that make us feel good or contribute to that feeling. Um, it's based on our perceived needs. And therapists, he says, uh, must be people who could be added to the client's quality world. So um, he would say that we need to develop a positive and professional relationship with the client and uh, the client needs to see that we are helping them in some way to facilitate progress, that uh, our sessions are positive. Um, so there has to be some incentive to coming to see a counselor. Uh, from this relationship, people also learn uh, how to get close to others. Um, we model positive relationships with the client on a professional level. And then the client can take what they've learned from that and apply it to other relationships outside of counseling. Um, he gives this image of a car. He says, the motor is our needs. Uh, the steering, we move in the direction of our quality world. Um, and by moving, he means we make choices. Uh, the front of the car affects the back of the car. Front wheels are acting and thinking. The back wheels are feeling and physiology. He says that there are three reasons for suffering choices. Anger is an easy choice in a frustrating relationship, but it is not socially acceptable. So depressing and other symptoms restrain anger. Depression is a means to ask for help indirectly without begging or reducing our own power. Somebody says, well, how are you doing today? Well, I'm depressed. Oh, why? What's, what's going on? So it is indirectly asking for help. Depression and other symptoms allow us to avoid doing what we are afraid to do. They are an excuse. This is what he says. Uh, reality begins with the unfulfilling relationship or non-existent relationship, but it doesn't focus on fault. Rather, it looks at what is within the client's control. Um, we have to understand what's within our control and what's not within our control. What we are able to make choices about. Individuals have to take personal responsibility for their choices and actions. Kind of existential. Complaining is not an effective behavior. It doesn't get us anywhere unless you're a child complaining to a parent. Um, and, uh, and he wants us to be independent. Um, we should work with positive choices, not negative choices, and also engage in meaningful activities. Um, he rejects transference immediately. Um, it's just another way to avoid personal responsibility. The present uh, the past can't be changed, no matter whose fault it was. Um, we must at some point take responsibility for ourselves in the present 
and begin to move forward. I guess an example about this would be I've, I've had a lot of clients uh, who have suffered all kinds of abuse, emotional, physical, sexual. We process the abuse, um, we work through it, um, and, uh, and we always get to a place where the client has to make a choice. They have to make a, a real choice to uh, choose to no longer be a victim of that abuse uh, in a metaphorical way, um, to move forward with their lives, to move beyond the abuse. I'm not negating the abuse. You know, we spend a long time uh, facilitating this, this process of of healing with clients. Uh, it's, it's not easy. There's no negation of the abuse in the past. However, if the client wants a positive future, um, they have to make a choice to move forward and no longer live in that negative past. Um, Let's see, um, not focusing on a symptom. Discussing symptoms is another avoidance behavior. Therapy, here's some example questions he might ask. What are your current relationships like, if any? What are your needs and goals? Are they positive? Are they being met through your current behaviors? Many times people might have had goals, but they weren't fulfilling. Well, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Let's see what's going on there. Um, the cycle of therapy has two components, um, creating the counseling environment and implementing procedures that lead to changes in behavior. New choices equal new behaviors and better feelings if they are positive choices. Techniques, building a positive relationship between therapist and client, gentle confrontation. Uh, it can be brief therapy. Um, there was always um, a need with his theory to have a little more structure so Wobelding, who was his colleague um, and my professor's professor, uh, created what he called WDEP. W stands for what are your wants and needs. D, direction and doing. What are you doing to meet those wants and needs? E, evaluation. Well, let's evaluate this process. P, okay, what are we going to do differently? What choices are we going to make? What plan uh, to make this direction more positive so that we can meet those needs? Um, there is a difference between wants and needs. I talk about that extensively uh, in other classes like the grief and loss class. Um, and then Wobelding gave me these charts that I included in your notes. One is a uh, graphic that shows the process of WDEP and all of the subcategories. And then there is a write-up about each step in WDEP. And you can read that for yourselves.